This is Cast of Wonders, the young adult fiction podcast featuring stories of the fantastic. Welcome, I'm Catherine Inskip, your editor and host. Episode 431, Little Wonders 27. Today's stories are both on the theme of old ladies, and we very much hope you enjoy them. First up is The Soup Witch's Funeral Dinner by Nicole LaBeouf. Short fiction by Nicole J. LaBeouf has appeared on the podcasts Tales to Terrify and Toasted Cake, the magazine Nameless Digest, and the anthology Blood and Other Cravings. She has microfiction at Daily Science Fiction, and her poetry has been published in Sycorax Journal, The Macabre Museum, and Eternal Haunted Summer. Nicole is originally from New Orleans, and has not let a little thing like moving to Colorado stop her from trying to grow melatonin and okra. She skates roller derby with the Boulder County Bombers under the name Fleur de Beast. She tweets at Nicole J. LaBeouf, blogs at NicoleJLaBeouf.com, and publishes very short story-like objects four times monthly for subscribers to her Friday Fictionettes project at Patreon.com slash NicoleJLaBeouf. An earlier version of this story first appeared as part of her Friday Fictionettes project on Patreon, and was released as a Fictionette freebie in March 2018. This story is narrated by Adam Pract. Adam Pract lives in Kansas, but asks that you not hold that against him. His full-time day job is as marketing and volume purchasing program coordinator for Smoky Hill Education Service Centre in Salina, continuing his career of putting his talents to work in support of education. He was a 2002 college recipient of the Robert F. Kennedy Award for writing about the disadvantaged, and has published a disappointingly slim volume of short stories called Frame Story, Seven Stories of Sci-Fi and Fantasy, Horror and Humour, which is available from Amazon as an e-book or in paperback. He's been working on his second volume, Schrodinger's Zombie, Seven Weird and Wonderful Tales of the Undead, since 2012 and successfully finished the first story. He hopes to complete it before he's cremated and takes up permanent residence in an urn. You can also hear his narration and audio production work on two self-described mediocre audible audiobooks, and as a regular producer and occasional narrator for the Drabblecast. A quick content warning, this first story covers themes of terminal illness and bereavement. And now, we've a tale to tell. The Soup Witch's Funeral Dinner by Nicole LaBeouf Narrated by Adam Pratt One morning, late March, Sammy Taylor visited the soup witch. He hadn't planned to. He was busy wrestling with his father's crankiest sewing machine when the good smell from the soup witch's cauldron yanked him out the door by his nose. Sammy came to the soup witch's door a little resentful and a whole lot hungry. The soup witch handed him a bowl and a spoon, led him through to the backyard, and ladled him up what was in the cauldron. One sip chased resentment away. Sammy ate until all the soup was gone. When he was done, the soup witch said, Sammy, I need to train up a successor, and it looks like it's going to be you. Why me? Because that was a successor finding soup. You're who came and ate it? So you're who I'm going to train. Got a problem with that? Well, it beat a future of mending the whole town's trousers. Besides, after years of, Sammy, come here, and Sammy, do this, he was mighty attracted to the prospect of getting to order everyone else around for a change. So he agreed to become the soup witch's apprentice. Lessons weren't very interesting at first. They were all about making soup. Sammy had expected soup. It was right there in the job title, but so was witch. And he didn't seem to be learning anything witchy. When do I get to do magic? Not till you get a handle on the mirepoix, said the soup witch, and the sofrito and the Holy Trinity. You want to do magic, you gotta learn how to cook. Now dice these carrots. 
He had to learn how to build fires for boiling and for simmering. He had to chop wood and stack it to age. He had to learn the names, parts, and uses of hundreds of plants. Animals, too. He had to render the fats and oils for cooking with and for seasoning the cauldron. Sometimes the smoke got so thick Sammy could hardly see over the next-door neighbor's fence. But nobody ever came round to complain. Nobody came round at all. Not unless they needed a cure. He didn't thank you, Sammy observed one day after the latest patient went home. It's a thankless task, the soup witch agreed. What can cure can kill, and they know it. So why do we do it? Because we can, said the soup witch. Because it needs doing. By the height of summer, the soup witch started to teach Sammy how to listen to the cauldron. It wants something, it'll give you a nudge. Halfway to chicken dumpling, you'll get the idea for beef barley. You'll reach for a niece, come up with Angelica. But only if you learn how to listen. How does a cauldron know? The soup witch shrugged. How do birds know when to fly? But why should it get to decide who gets cures and who doesn't? Why should you? Sammy did start to hear that cauldron, a little at first and then a whole lot more. So the soup witch had him tend to more of the patients. He sat by while they ate their soup, and if they wanted to talk, he listened. That kind of listening took some learning, too. Sometimes they said the kind of things you only say to your doctor or your priest. Sometimes they just told him they were proud of him. One evening, late September, Sammy froze with his hand over the cauldron. He'd gone where it had nudged him, just like usual. Only the pinch of this was... Nightshade. And the bit of that was Angel's trumpet. And he'd already put it in. He'd made a soup for killing. Its treacherous good smell was even now reeling its victim in. The soup witch put a hand on his shoulder. It's all right, Sammy. That soup's for me. Sammy's heart went pang, and his throat went tight. Why you? What that cauldron can't cure tends to kill long and ugly. The long part's just about over. The ugly part's getting close. She held out her bowl. That soup there'll be a kindness. Killing the soup witch was the saddest thing Sammy had ever done. But he did it. He ladled her up what was in the cauldron. And he watched her eat until all the soup was gone. Sammy said the soup witch. You're gonna have to help me to my bed. He just about had to carry her there. He tucked her in, and she squeezed his hand tight. You take care of them now. They need you. They never loved me, but they like you. They got no fear of you, so they'll let you take care of them. Now that you know how. Then she went to sleep. And she never woke up again. Sammy sat there all night long. At dawn, he let go of her poor, cold hand and wondered what came next. She needed burying, but he couldn't think clear how to start. So he started making soup because he knew how to make soup. The smell grew rich and strong, until even Sammy himself longed for a taste. The doorbell rang. Sammy came through the house and opened the door. There, 
on the soup witch's porch and in the soup witch's front yard and overflowing into the street, where there are neighbors and almost neighbors and people from all over town. Sammy's friends and family were there, and everyone Sammy had tended, and everyone the soup witch had ever cured too. Everyone who was still alive and still in town and could make their own two feet or someone else's take them over. Everyone had brought a bowl and a spoon. Come on through, Sammy told them. Soup's on. And that was the soup witch's funeral dinner. And Sammy thought, maybe they did love her a little. After all. This is an absolutely beautiful story, isn't it? I have a real soft spot for domestic fantasy. Sammy and the soup witch make a great partnership together, and it's lovely to see Sammy grow into his trade and into his adulthood. Sammy is a quiet but powerful protagonist here. He learns to trust the magic, to trust himself, and to cook amazing soup. Mostly, we see him learning to understand people, what draws us together, and what makes life worthwhile. Nicole had this to say about her story. Most of my stories begin with a writing prompt, and I find it fascinating to look back from a finished piece at the prompt that originally inspired it. With that in mind, this story is brought to you by the words deleterious and enigmatic, the phrase merciful broth, and the eight of pentacles. Our second story is Grandma Geraldine Sees a Dragon, by C. M. de Girolamo, a Cast of Wonders original. C. M. de Girolamo is a recovering linguistics PhD student, a fictional language consultant, and a graduate of the Odyssey Writing Workshop. Her work can be found in Daily Science Fiction, the Tragedy Queen's Anthology from Clash Books, the Manawaker Flash Fiction Podcast, and is upcoming in New Myths and Monsters Out of the Closet. This story is narrated by Cheyenne Wright. Cheyenne Wright is a wizard that can turn into a dragon, or a dragon posing as a wizard. He forgets which. Either way, he makes comics, art for games, and humans can contribute to his hoard via patreon.com slash docarcane. He narrates short stories for a variety of venues where he is known as podcasting's Mr. Buttery Man Voice and is an EA storyteller. And now, we have another tale to tell. Grandma Geraldine Sees a Dragon by Cara Di Gerolamo The dragon photo safari stuck its flyer under her door not long after Albert died, and Geraldine hung it on her refrigerator, more for the lovely sunset pictured than for any interest in trekking through the mountains on another plane of existence to see a dragon. She forgot it was there until her neighbor's child, a charmless young person who drew alarming pictures in their notebook, glowered at it and asked, What's the point of going on a trip just to look at dragons? Never willing to let a child think they had one-upped her, Geraldine defended the idea. Dragons are majestic creatures, she said, wise and magical. Just the sight of them can change your life. People once spent their whole lives in the pursuit of just a brief glimpse of a dragon. She didn't mention that these people were called the Mad Dragon Hunters for good reason. And though people appreciated their work in getting the safari started, they were, well, mad. The child pursed their lips. So you're going? Geraldine hesitated. She shouldn't base her decisions on the disapproval of a child. But the child would sneer if she said no. Just another adult telling them how to think without following through. Of course, she said. This fall. Fall is the best time of year to see a dragon. By summer she'd forgotten her commitment to go in the fall. But then her family came to visit. 
Her daughter, Angie, certain her mother was in an inch from the grave, rattled on to her husband about Geraldine's health, which was as hearty as ever. As if Geraldine wasn't even there. Angie's children, Jake and Jess, wouldn't emerge from their phones unless there was twenty dollars in it. Neither one showed any tendency towards becoming interesting. Clearly, they took after their mother, or even their grandmother. Angie had been a frustratingly normal child. But recently, Geraldine had also begun to find herself tiresomely dull. When Angie threatened to visit again for Jake and Jess's fall break, Geraldine said very firmly, Oh, no, no, I'll be away. She registered for the safari that night. It was a long tour, mountain hikes and aching feet and lectures on dragon habits and habitats. The guide was a young thing and couldn't be trusted to get things right, so Geraldine made sure to prod him for further information at every opportunity. To her surprise, he grinned and happily kept answering her questions, even as the others in the group groaned and went to make tea in a billy can. They saw quite a few dragons, but only at a distance, dark shapes unfurling from a peak, spreading wings and catching the air. Geraldine took some excellent silhouette shots of dragons against sunsets and promised to keep in touch with half the people in her group. It was the last ascent of the trip. Lillian Lee's bunions had gotten the better of her, and Mr. and Mrs. Pickles had been too worn out to leave their tent for the pre-dawn start. So it was just Geraldine and Richard, an arrogant man with more money than charm, who was always complaining about the lack of cell service. Halfway up the mountainside, Richard twisted his ankle and demanded the guide help him down. Disappointment hit Geraldine unexpectedly heavy. This was their last hike. She wanted to have the chance to see one more dragon. The guide turned to Geraldine. She turned to head back down. Just keep up on the path, he said. Geraldine started in surprise. He never let them go off on their own. The guide smiled. Stay clipped to the rope, and you won't get lost. You've been listening to my instructions for weeks. My best student. Go on. Richard's indignancy made it all the sweeter. Geraldine left them limping downwards and continued towards the top of the ridge. Her footing wobbled stones skidding out from under her hiking sandals. Geraldine paused for breath, adjusted her sun hat, and clipped herself from one rope to the next, trusting her claw-footed stick for balance. She ascended the last few vertical yards and emerged on the ridge just as the sun broke the horizon. There before her, was the beast. The dragon's scales were lit red by the dawn. Its long form curled around the peak, neck arched, tail proud, the folded wings at rest. But ready at any point to stretch out and catch the air, the dragon blinked. Its eye was vast and yellow, veined with gold, the long slitted pupil darting and flicking until it slipped over and focused on Geraldine. It stared. Geraldine stared back. Automatically she reached for her camera. This would be a great shot. She could show everyone. But then... She lowered her hand, not wanting the apparatus to come between her and the great creature, not even for a moment. She wanted to see the tiny scales that curled in patterns along its eyelids, their colors a warm rust and an earth rainbow. 
the long, graceful claws on its finger-like digits, its scent powerfully alive, reptilian, with the rich undertone of magic. That same scent that tints the air in a secluded glen on a high mountain top overlooking the ocean. The dragon tipped its head to focus its other eye on her, wary of this intruder in its den, and then it did not smile. Dragon's mouths were not made to smile, but it did something, and Geraldine heard it, as if it had spoken words. It's all right, if it's you. In a whoosh, the dragon's wings spread, and it took to the air. The backdraft knocked Geraldine onto her behind, and the dragon spiraled up and then fell into a dive, disappearing off towards a distant mountain. Geraldine sat back, heart pounding. She had seen. She had been seen. The neighbor child was lurking outside when Geraldine returned. She almost tripped over them. Rainbows of dragons and colored skies in a world where magic was as thick as moisture in the summertime air streaming through her mind. You went, they said. Geraldine looked at her little house, in her little yard, in the little world that she, a little person, had disappeared into and smiled. I went. And then she quit her book group. Abandoned three committees. Bought four hundred dollars worth of hiking and camping equipment and applied for tour guide training. Her daughter thought she'd gone mad and refused to accept her phone calls, but in exchange for regular photographs, the neighborhood child sent postcards. And all their alarming pictures were now of dragons. This story also shows a character whose life goes in a direction they didn't expect. Geraldine had a comfortable and respectable retirement, but much like Bilbo Baggins, it wasn't enough for her. As for her respectability, well, that's a small price to pay when you have the chance to go eye to eye with a dragon. Be like Geraldine, listeners. Get out there. Seize the day. Join us again soon for another new episode. We love bringing you the best audio fiction week after week, but we can't do it without your support. Your donations pay our authors, our narrators, our servers and our staff. Please consider supporting us with a monthly donation through either PayPal or Patreon. You can also review us on Apple Podcasts, request us on Spotify and consider the stories we publish for award consideration. There are lots of ways you can help. Join the discussion on the EA forum, forum forum.escapeartist.net or visit on Twitter at Cast of Wonders. Come say hello. Cast of Wonders is a production of Escape Artists Incorporated and is brought to you by editor and host Catherine Inskip, assistant editors Andrew Cahoe and Carissa Sluss, associate editors Amy Brennan, Alicia Caparasso, William Haight Minor, Umera Hussein, Sean Proctor, Ray O, Susie Rodriguez, and Emma Smales. Our art director is Alexis Goebel, community manager Danny Daly, and our audio producer is Jeremy Carter. Our episodes are released under the Creative Commons Attribution on Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. That means you can download or listen to the episode on any device you like, but you can't change it or sell it. The Little Wonders theme music is Neversus by Alexei Nov, available from Promo DJ or his Facebook page. Thank you for listening.